Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Gitim Daf Kaf. Today's stuff is sponsored by Meryl Levine Page in loving memory of her father, Yosef Michael Halevi, on his 14th year at site. Our dad set us on the derech by modeling and encouraging both study and staka. We're going to get started with a story at the bottom of Yud Tedem a bit. We started with, we kind of, we had a few stories, the man who gives her the page, the, the, the get that looks like it has nothing written on it. We talked about that. Then we moved on to the get, um, what was it? The Right. He gives her the get and then she immediately throws it into the water and then we don't know, right? Then he claims, oh, it wasn't really a get. And then we had the get about, he threw it between the barrels. And then the question is, when we don't find it, is it that mice took it away, right? But if we find something else instead, maybe it's that, but only if there's one, right? If it's a mezuzah, only if there's one mezuzah, but if there's a bunch of mezuzahs there, then we don't assume that, you know, there happened to be a bunch of mezuzahs and also the thing he threw was a mezuzah. So it kind of depends on the scenario. Now we get to another strange story. If those weren't strange enough. Oh, Gavra, the Alebe Knista. Guy walks into a shul, okay? Let's just imagine the scene. Man walks into a shul. Shakal Sefer Torah. He takes a Sefer Torah from the shul. Yahiv Leila Debitu gives the Sefer Torah to his wife. Ve'amar la ha'agitech and says, here's your get. Wow, that's an interesting one. Whoever said a Sefer Torah could be a get. Well, Amar of Yosef. Rav Yosef says, Lemay Nichushla. What, what could possibly be? Like, could this be really a giving of a get? Well, imishum me milim. You might think that maybe, remember the invisible ink, maybe he wrote on the outside of the parchment of the, of the Sefer Torah a get. In other words, what's the deal? We don't see a get in the, in the Sefer Torah. So it's not like there's a get. So option number one, he says, maybe it was written in this ink that we can't see, the invisible ink. And maybe really he wrote a get on the outside of the parchment and we just don't see it. Well, we can't worry about that because Eme Milin, Hagab Eme Milin. Remember, we said that that kind of substance doesn't take when the parchment is processed with the same water soaked in gallnut, right? Which is what they always did with the parchment of a Sefer Torah. So there's no concern that it was written with this, with gallnut water, which, which becomes invisible because, or you can't really see it so well because it wouldn't work anyway. So that wouldn't work. Well, maybe you say, it's true it doesn't say, this is a get, I'm giving you, blah, 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 blah. But it does say in the Torah, if you want to divorce your wife and you write her a book, a kritut, a sefer kritut, that means, ah, sefer kritut is in the Torah. And maybe by giving it to her, he's basically giving her a sefer kritut because it says sefer kritut in there, a book that separates between them. Yeah, I see your face. It's a little bit um, creative. So, habi'inan v'katav la lishma v'leka. I see someone just wrote this in the chat, right? It's exactly the issue. It's not lishma. You can't do that. Well, maybe we have a resolution for that. Maybe he wrote the whole Sefer Torah. Maybe it was his Sefer Torah, right? It's not like he came in and stole the Sefer Torah, right? We didn't talk about that. But it was his Sefer Torah that was sitting in the shul. He hired a Sefer to write it and said, when you write the word Sefer Kritut, have in mind my wife. And then it's Lishma. Well, that's not going to happen because Habi Inan Shina Shmo, Ushma, Ushem Iro, Vashem Ira. Has to have his name, her name, the name of the city, his city, her city. Has to have everything there, Veleka. And this clearly doesn't happen. So, now, I think, I mean, in fact, I saw, most of you came up with these issues already, and I saw in the chat, and this is kind of obvious. So, Rav Yosef, my Kamashvila, what was he really trying to teach us in telling us this story and telling us all these possibilities that were quite clear this wasn't going to work? She'en me milin al gabe me milin. Well, the first one was not one you probably thought of. And that's what Rav Yosef wanted us to know, that you can't write with this gall, this water soap, with uh, gall nuts soaked in the water, you can't use that water for writing on if the parchment was processed with gall nut water, and that's what he wanted to teach. Okay, interesting beginning of the daf. In general, there's a bunch of interesting, strange things in the daf today. Amar of Chista, get shekatvo shalolishma. Let's say the get was written shalolishma. Now, before I even start, we have to remember yesterday's daf. Yesterday's daf, we had a whole discussion. Can you write with ink on top of other ink? Right, the get's written already, you want to put ink on top of ink. And we said ink on top of ink, if it's the same kind of ink, definitely doesn't work. We had a question, maybe black on top of red, maybe that would work, but ink on top of ink doesn't work. Now this sugya seems to indicate the opposite. <coughs> it's going to be a little confusing, but it's a little bit of a different situation, and we'll talk about what the differences are. And there also we saw 
that when it comes to writing on Shabbat, you're not liable if it's black on black, for example. Okay, so it's also not writing. But this sugar seems to indicate otherwise. Now, the issue here is not that your get was written and you write on top of it, but the get was written shalo lishma. It was written without lishma. So it's written for Yosef and Miriam, but it wasn't written for this Yosef and this Miriam. And the sofer, basically, instead of writing a whole new parchment, he takes the same parchment and he puts ink over it and writes lishma. Now, why is this different from the previous case? Good question, right? It seems to be the same. It's ink on top of ink. So Tosfot asked this question already on Yutet. He kind of knew this sugya existed and started talking about the sugya and said, how do we reconcile that sugya with this sugya? Well, that sugya said it definitely wasn't writing. And here, they're going to say, not only is it, they want to suggest it's a machlok of between Rabbi Yehud and the rabbis in a different place, they're even going to say that even there where the rabbis don't allow, might allow it here. So it seems to indicate this is okay. So Tosa there suggests that in this case, we're actually fixing it. The writing on top of writing is new writing because it's writing lishma. You have to fix something. So when you have to fix something, that's already, right? Imagine you cook something and then you cooked it badly and then you have to fix up the cooking. Could you call that cooking? Maybe, right? So that's a possible way to go. Some people say maybe this disagrees with the previous sugya and there's just different opinions. Um, Ramban is a very interesting ex- explanation. It doesn't really resolve the get issue. But he says there, when it comes to Shabbat, it's different from get. Why is that? Because for Shabbat, you need to be chayav from a lechet machshev in a creative action. And this is not creative because you're writing on top of another writing. Whereas for get, you don't need creativity. It's not the, right, it's not the requirement of get, and maybe that's why it would work. But it doesn't really resolve why the get there also seems to be not good. Anyway, there's a lot of things to be said about the sugya, but I'm going to learn the sugya anyway. And remember, there's this big question because it really... How it jives with the other sugya is not so clear. And it's kind of surprising the Gemara doesn't start saying, well, how did this jive with what we saw yesterday? In any case, let's get back to our case. So you basically didn't do it lishma, the sofer. And then he does it again lishma. So now, banu lemachloket rabbi Yehuda v'rabbanan. It's the same machloket as rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis when it comes to writing a sefer Torah. Ditanya. Now there's a halacha also of lishma. When you, that when you write Lishma, when you write uh, the names of God, you have to have intent about writing the names of God. Now, the name of God is spelled in the Torah, right? A Yud, and then a He, and then a Vav, and then a He. So it's very similar to the word Yehuda. It's just without the Dalit. So now they say, You're up to the part, you're a Sofer, you're writing the Sefer Torah, you're up to the name of God, but in your mind, you think for a minute that you're writing Yehuda. So you have the wrong intent. Now, while you were writing Yehuda, maybe you call this a Freudian mistake or something, right? You, you actually write the, sh- the name of God. You forget about the Vav. And you write it, and it comes out the name of God. But you didn't intend for it to be the name of God. No, it's supposed to be the name of God there. But you didn't have the right intention. So what do you do? You sanctify it by redoing it. But redoing it doesn't mean erase and do it again. You just write on top of it. Okay? That seems to see this wor- say this works. Tivrei Rabbi Yehuda. You can't write God's name in this way. So we have a machloket. And basically what Rav Chista said is, it's probably the same machloket by get. Same thing, if you write the get shalom lishma, can you write on top or not? That's Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis debate. But now, I'm Rav Achabar Yaakov, Domalohi. Rav Achabar Yaakov says, no, maybe this isn't the case. Agkan, now, it, by the way, if you went with the rabbis, and not Rabbi Yehuda, you could just say that the whole sugya before was the rabbis and not Rabbi Yehuda. And then you would resolve it. But Rav Acha clearly, again, if you assume it's the same thing, he's clearly going against the sugya there. And that's what one of the Rishonim says. So Rav Acha disagrees with the Gemara there. Dilma lohi, ad kan lo ka'amre rabbanan ha'atam de bi'inan ze'li van ve'u v'leik, aval ha'cha lo. Get it's not a problem at all. It's only a problem by a Sefer Torah according to the rabbis. The rabbis would say by get it's totally fine. Again, that's really what contradicts our previous sugya. Because in a Sefer Torah, there's a special halacha of ze'eli vanvei. You have to beautify the Torah. Now, when you write on top, right? You ever fix something? You write something and then you write on top of it again? It never looks the same. It's not beautiful when you do it like that. And it's also, you could say also, like, do it right the first time. Right? When you're going to do something right, do it right the first time. It's not appropriate to have a Sefer Torah where you wrote on top of it. But that doesn't exist by get. The get doesn't have to be beautiful. No one ever said that. It just has to be effective. So maybe by get... You wouldn't need that, and you really could do this. Amar of Chista. Another strange statement. 
Yachilnu lemipsilinu lekule gita dalma. If I wanted, I could disqualify all the gitim that exist in this world. Okay, what's going to be even stranger about the fact that he makes this statement is we're not going to be able to figure out what on earth he meant by this. We're going to try. Rav is going to make two attempts to try to understand what he was talking about. But in the end, both are rejected and we're not going to really end up understanding why he said this. So, Amalei Rava. Rava said to him, My time, what's the reason? This is going to be a very interesting halacha that's at the background of what Rava is saying. Who's supposed to pay the sofer for writing the get? The man or the woman, right? What would you assume? The man. He writes the get. He needs to write the get. So you would assume that means if he's not going to write it, he's going to pay for it to be written. However, what's the problem? The problem is if you make the husband write the get and pay for it, well, maybe he won't do it. So the rabbis actually, it's so fascinating, right? They want to protect the women, but in the end, the women have to pay, right? So in order to protect women from not being a no, you see all the time they're thinking about this, they instituted that women have to pay the sofer to write the get. And which is really a little unfair to them. On the other hand, it protects them because otherwise the men would just not pay the money and you know live happily on their own marrying another woman and the women would be stuck without a get. Because remember, in those days you can marry more than one wife. So Rava says, is it maybe because it says, in other words, in the end, based on the rabbinic, um, based on the rabbinic decree of the women have to pay, it doesn't do what it says in the Torah. Maybe that's what Rav Chista means, because v'chatav, right? It says in the Torah, you, the man, has to write it. V'hacha ihi kakatvala. But here, she's the one writing it again. It's not her, but she's paying for it. V'dilma aknuya afna la rabbanan. But that's not a problem. Why is it not a problem? Because there's a concept in halacha called hefker beitin hefker. The beitin has the rights to arbitrarily, okay, usually, they, hopefully, they wouldn't do this arbitrarily, but take things that belong to one person, and put them in someone else's domain or, or make them ownerless. In this case, it's actually passing them on to somebody else, which is a little more than the average hefker bait and hefker. But it means they can decide that your money is not your money if they wanted to. So that means that every get, basically, it's as if when the rabbis institute this takanah, the woman has to pay. What it really means is the woman pays the sofer, but it gets transferred into the husband's domain. And then again, what happens? Vinatana, he gives to her and then it's hers. We're going to get to the whole thing about her further on the stuff and the get going to her. And does she own it? We'll talk about that or can, whatever. We'll get to that whole thing about giving it to her. But right now we're saying that can't be the problem. Okay? That's not why he possibly gets. So now they say, ah, Now getting to the giving of the get. So now it says he has to give her. Now what does he give her? He gives her a piece of parchment with a bunch of words. In fact, he could give her, we're going to see this in a minute, right? We saw this in the Mishnah. He could give her on a, a leaf from an olive tree. Is that worth anything? No. Now, when it says in the Torah, Vinatan, generally that means he gives. You have to give something of value. So, he doesn't give her anything of value, right? Because he could give her a piece of paper that's worth nothing with some words on it. So, it's a get, but it doesn't have any value. Well, Dilma not get he. No, maybe when the Torah says give it to her, what they mean is give her something that has the words of the get written on it, which is what you and I would have thought without reading this. You wouldn't have thought give her a gift, whoever said that. No, that's not a problem. And not only that, how do I know he doesn't need to give her anything of value? Because Tedan de Shachumitan, they sent this letter from Israel to Babylonia to teach us a halacha. And it said, If you write on something that's forbidden to benefit from, now something that's forbidden to benefit, right? let's say it was used for Avodah Zara purposes, so I can't benefit from it at all. If I can't benefit at all, what value does it have on the market? Zero. It's worth nothing because you can't do anything with it. So if you write her on a get that is worth nothing, basically, because it's a sorba it's forbidden to benefit, it's actually a good get. So you see that there's no requirement at all for giving her something of value, so that can't be what Rav Chista was saying. And in the end, we really have no idea why Rav Chista made this strange statement of, I could have disqualified all the Giti. Now, since we already mentioned this, we're now going to go into this line. Shachumitam, they sent from there, Katavo lisureana kashel. So now, Amoravashi, why are you saying this? Afana nami tanina, it says so in an explicit Mishnah. Al ha'ale shel zayid. Our Mishnah says you could write on a leaf from, a, from an olive tree. How much is that worth? Nothing. 
right? I have an olive tree outside. They're teeny leaves. If you don't recognize olive trees, right? I mean, if you live in Israel, you definitely know what they are. Other places as well, but they're very small. First of all, the whole concept of writing on an olive tree, on a leaf of an olive tree is very strange. The leaves are teeny, maybe fig, but, you know, big, but, or grape leaves, but olive seems very weird. But anyway, we'll get to this. So they say, no, dil mashane alesh alzai If you're going to write on one of those, is even though it's not worth anything, you theoretically could, it, it, it could be combined with other leaves. Imagine you make like a string and you string together a whole bunch of these leaves. And with that, you write the get. If you take all those leaves together, they might actually be worth something. Right? All they have to do is be worth a pruta for it to be something of value. So that's why you can't necessarily learn it from a Mishnah, and that's why they had to tell you, really, it doesn't have to be on anything of value, even though maybe you would have learned it from the Mishnah, but it's not 100% clear from the Mishnah. Tanya. Now we're going to talk more about this halacha. Not only did they send this letter from Israel, but in the time of the Tanaim, already Rebbe said this. Rebbe Yomel ketavol isurayana kashil. He said this halacha. Nafik levi, drasha mishmei de Rebbe velo kasura. Levi went out and darshaned this in the name of Rebbe, but people didn't accept it. I'm like, okay, very nice you say this in the name of Rebbe, but okay, we're moving on. Mishmei de Rabbim v'kilsua, but that wasn't good enough for him. He really wanted to make sure that they kept this halacha, or that they knew this halacha, that it's okay to do this. So he then said, actually, I learned it in the name of many rabbis, not just Rebbe, and then they actually accepted it. Alma, what do you learn from here? This must be the halacha, because Levi wouldn't have gone so far as to push this issue if it wasn't really that we passed in this way. Now, that was an aside about writing on Isurana. Ah, now we're back to the writing of uh, some other things about the writing of the get. Tanu Rabana, Vikatav, Velochakak. According to the Brighta, it says, you write it, but you can't engrave it. Okay? So now they say, if you write it, but you can't engrave it. So, are you trying to say the chakika is not writing? It can't be etched in, okay? You can't um, carve it out, chisel it. So now they say, Uruminu, what do you mean? We have a source that says the following. If an Eved, a slave, which we already compared his document of emancipation to a get of a woman, and he goes out with writing on a tavla, like a, a wooden block that was, or a pinkas, okay, some other type of book type thing, which is chiseled out. It works. So what do you see, right? What can't you do? It doesn't work. As what's considered writing? Chiseled out stuff is considered writing. What's not? Not if you embroidered on a, a hat, like a wool hat, or a wool piece of jewelry. No, wool jewelry is, but apparently they had jewelry made out of wool. If you embroidered the wording, imagine, right, taking, doing embroidery and writing the wording of the get, that doesn't work. But chiseling, that works. So what do you see here? How could you say? The Brita said, katav This seems to say it's totally fine to do chiseling. Amar ula, amar There's two ways to chisel. One way of chiseling is taking out the insides of the letters, which means that the letters are going to be jutting out, right? If you erase the inside, right, and the, and the outer part of the letter, then the letter ends up going outward. That's not called writing. Why is it not called writing? Because the part that you're actually chiseling is not the letter. It's to make the letter appear, but it's not actually the letter. That doesn't work. That's the bright time. But the other one we quoted about the Eved with the Tavla, that Dechak Yerechok. It's where you chiseled out where the letters are supposed to be. So that's kind of just like writing the letters. You're just kind of removing them from the parchment and that works. To which the Gemara asks, what do you mean? You can't actually take out the inside of the letters and have it going outside and, you know, having it jet out. That should work. Uriminhu. Now we're going to talk about the seat. Okay, before we go on, the Gemara should have told us this right at the get-go, but I'm going to read you a pasuk. It actually comes up on the Amu Bet. In Shemot chapter 39, verse 30, it says, This is the, the, the head plate 
on the forehead of the Kohen Gadol, he wears this. It's made out of gold, to have taho, pure gold. Vayichtivu alav michtav pituchei chotam kodesh l'ashem. And they write on it the letters, okay? The letters, it's, it's etched, it's chiseled in. Kodesh l'ashem. Those words appear. Now, how did they chisel it? So, it says here, lo hayak tavosh chukea. They didn't chisel it in, okay, like we just said. Ela bolet kedina rezahav. They compare it to coins. What happens with coins, right? The, 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 the design, the face or whatever it is on the coin, juts out. Okay, so now we're going to say, how does it jut out, right? It's not in, engraved in. It juts out. So the seats, the letters, went outward. So what do you see here? It says it has to be written, and yet it works even if it juts out. Now we assume, how did it jut out of the gold? Because you basically, you were, uh, you chiseled out the empty, right? Or again, it's gold, you didn't chisel, but you knocked in the empty parts, and the other part basically um, stuck out. So now they say, um, no. Right, ha dinarei zahav tochoten, aren't dinarei zahav tochot, we're actually going to have a whole question, are they tochot or not, but aren't they tochot, aren't dinarei zahav, in a sense, what you did is, you basically pushed in the empty, right, the part you don't want, and therefore, the, the, the image that you wanted was raised, so they say, no, ki dinarei zahav, lo ki dinarei zahav, it's like coins, but not exactly like coins, okay, Coins are done to chot. You're right. But this was done not like coins. How so? It looked like that it was raised as opposed to being inward. How did they do the seats? They didn't do it the same way they make coins. Coins they make by pressing down on them and basically pressing down the part you don't want, in which case you end up with the image jutting out. But the seats, they would come from the other end. So imagine you have this breastplate and it's raised. Why is it raised? Because from the other end, you went and you took a little hammer and you knocked the, the gold outward to do the letters. So you wrote it in a way that was written because you, again, it's not exactly chiseling, but it's like chiseling in the direction where you're basically pushing out the words. But from the perspective of those looking at it, they're looking from the other side of it and it's basically raised and not indented. So there you have your answer. Amar le Ravina le Ravash. Rushma mechatz haritz okinufe mechanif. Now they say, okay, well, how really do you make? Now forget we learned what we just learned. And we're starting from scratch. And he says to him, how do they make coins? When they take the imprint, right, the thing of the coin, and they basically put you know something down and knock on it, right, and make this um, this, and the coin comes out with the with the shape on it. So is it mikhratz haritz, like we said, basically you're pushing down the part you don't want and therefore the image is raised? Or kinufei machnif, is it that you're pushing the whole thing together and then from that it expands into the empty space of what your, you know, your shape? And then it's different. Then it basically is jutting out, more like what we saw in the seats. So they say, amalei mikhratz haritz. No, it's not like the seats. You're not doing it right. It's not like engraving. No, it really is that you're basically pushing it down and then the, the shape is, is just remaining in the outward part where it was to begin with, right? You're just, the parts you don't want, it's like the holes in the words are going in. ATV, but now, this is why I said it's like starting over because they're quoting the source about the seats as if we understood it the first way and then they're going to answer the same way we understood it eventually. Lo yaktavo shokea ala bolet kedina chesaha. So the tzitz was written, right? Not indented, but it was raised like the coins. The And if you're going to say the coins were engraved, right, went inward, you need to write it and you don't have that. So, to answer this question, they say, well, it was only somewhat like coins and not fully like coins. It's like the coins, but it's not really like the coins because when it comes to the coins, right, there it's from the outside and here, uh, there it's from the inside and here it's from the outside. And that's right when, again, when it's the coins, you're pushing from the outside, pushing in, right, and here you're pushing from the inside going outward. So it's done in a different way and therefore that's not a question. 
Okay, new question. We're really getting into all sorts of strange things in this stuff. Katav la get al tas shel zahav. He writes her again on a beautiful piece of gold, maybe because we were talking about the seats, which was gold, so they get into gold here. Can he do it two in one? Say, here's a piece of gold. Your get, your ketuba is written on it. I'm sorry, your get is written on it. And since it's worth a lot of money, I'm going to give it to you and it's going to be your ketuba. So now, what could be the problem here? You have to understand some background. If he writes a get, we're going to get to this only in a few minutes. Well, they didn't say it now, but I'll read it even inside. A few lines later, it says, Tanu Rabbanan. If he gives her the get and says, the paper is mine. I told you we get back to this thing about giving it. If he gives her the get and says, but the paper is mine, it says in the Torah, v'natama. he has to give it to her. Now, it's true he doesn't have to give her anything of value. We already learned that. But he does have to give her the paper, which isn't worth anything, because if he doesn't give her the paper and she doesn't own the paper, then again, this is all just theoretically like um, in your imagination kind of thing, but... In the abstract way, the otiyot or porchot ba'avir, they say. It's like, if you don't have the paper, then it's just letters floating in the air. And that doesn't count. So if he gives her the, he gives it to her physically, but says, but the paper belongs to me, that's not giving. He has to give it to her completely. But in this case, he gives it to her completely. But he's separating the words from the paper or the gold. He's basically saying, the gold and the background is your tuba. And the words are your get. But she does get to keep it all. So does that mean they're porchot bavir because you're separating them? Or since it's all belonging to her anyway, it doesn't really matter. So what does he say? Amar lei. Rav Nachman answers, nit kabla gitav and nit kabla ktubata. This actually works because in the end, she stays with it. We don't view them as if they're floating because it all has one owner. It's not like he owns that and she owns that. ATV, to which the Gemara says, but we have a contradiction. A different source says, it's He says, here's a piece of gold. Your get is written on it. The margins, okay, all the parts on the side that don't have ketuba, uh, get written on it, count for your ketuba. This works. The get is a get, and the sides, the margins, are for her ketuba. Now, this seems to imply only because there were margins, right? that he couldn't give her the space where the get was written, sounds like Tamadi Kashal. It's because there's specifically stuff left over. Hale Kashal, lo, but if there wasn't anything in the margins, it would sound like this wouldn't work. And that contradicts what we said before, because there he said, here's your get, and it counts as your ketubah as well, even the part, right, the, which has the words around it. So they answer no. Huadin afagav delay Kashal. That's, it doesn't really matter whether there's margins or not. So why did this one specifically talk about the margins? It wanted to teach you how kamashmalan da'af agav di kashal. They wanted you to know the following, something else entirely. Let's say he gives her a get on gold, and he doesn't say anything about this is your ketubah, and it has margins and parts that don't have get the get written on it, and he gives it to her. Now, you might, right? So now they're going to tell you this. Even if there's sha'al, there's stuff on the sides, and it's worth a lot of money, only if when he says it, this will be for your ketubah, does it count for her ketubah. But if he didn't say it, it's not going to count for her ketubah. Now, he has to say from the beginning, if he wants to use this as the ketubah also, he has to say whatever's on the outside counts as your ketubah, or even if he didn't say whatever's on the outside. He could say this whole thing is your ketubah. But the point is, even if there's big wide margins, and he gives her this expensive piece of of gold with her ketuba, with her get written on it and lots of extra space, he can't later claim, oh, by the way, that was your ketuba, unless he stated it at the beginning. Otherwise, we just assume he gave her the get. At that point, he can't say, it belongs to her at this point, he can't say, oh, now I'm giving you your ketuba, you know, 10 years later or a year later or a day later, it does, it's already hers. But if he said it from the beginning, then it works. My taima, avira de megiltu. Okay, what's the reason for this? Because, just one second, I want to check one thing here. Um, second. Mm-hmm. Right, because the because we don't view it as a piece of gold, we view it as the airspace of the Megillah. 
Okay, basically the holes and the, the, the lines in between are just part of the airspace of the Megillah and it's not, it's not at all considered a piece of gold that he could say was used for something else. Again, unless he specifies it from the beginning. And it's not a matter of intent, it's a matter of wording. And this is a get given to you under condition, right? I'm giving you this gift or this item, but know that this item has two parts to it. This counts as this and that counts as that. Whereas if he doesn't state that, then it, he can't claim it is, even if that was his intention. Tanu Rabbanan. Now we get to this part that was the background for this, which is if I give you this get, or a husband gives his wife the get and says, but the paper's mine, she's not divorced. But if he says, I'm giving this to you as a gift for the moment, but I would like you to return me the paper after I give it to you, that's totally fine. Because she only needs, it needs to be hers for a moment, just while she accepts it. After that, it doesn't need to be hers. She doesn't need to own it. So he can actually take it back. By Rav Papa, Rav Papa asked the following question. What if he wants to give her the space in between the lines? Or I'm sorry, he wants to keep the space in between the lines or in between the letters. Does this work? Okay, can he say, I'm giving you, right, the, the paper, but not the space in between the lines and not the space in between the words? To which the Gemara says, Teku, that doesn't, we don't really have an answer for that question. But then the Gemara says, why don't you say, glad to say for It says you have to give a Sefer Kritut, which means a book that separates. One of the things they learn from Sefer Kritut has to be one Sefer and not multiple. So you can't have it on a lot of klafim. Okay, it's a lot of different parchments. You can if you actually attach them all together. But it can't be like we saw with the, the leaf, right? You can attach a bunch together. But you can't have it on separate pieces. Now, if you cut around all the letters or all the lines, you're going to have a lot of separate pieces of paper. So, or whatever it is. So, how could, how could that work? To which they say, right? And therefore, it's obvious this doesn't work. They say, no, because lo tzricha de me'ure. It's where if you cut... Okay, now you have to be a good cutter to do this, be able to cut properly. But when, again, this is all imaginary because it's just saying that part belongs to me. But in the Hebrew language, you have kuf, which goes all the way down, and you have lavid, which goes all the way up. So there aren't really spaces in between the lines. So you would have to end up, you know, cutting in and out, in and out, and the whole thing would actually be attached. So if the whole thing would actually be attached, then we have the question, and then we're left with this question. Okay. I see the comments about, you know, what kind of guy is this and what kind of crazy situation. Again, I think that for the most part, although we did have this actual case where the guy actually gave his wife a safe return and said, this is your get. So it's hard to say this is all theoretical, but I imagine that most of these situations are, are somewhat theoretical. Um, and they're really just trying to get to conceptually what's the idea of what is he, again, it goes back to before where they even suggested maybe he needs to give her something of value, right? But he doesn't. But he does need to give her wording on something. Because wording floating in the air is nothing. So she does have to receive something. The question is, where do we draw the lines? And that's really what they're trying to get at in this part. Okay, we're going to end with two questions, and then we'll do a summary of the daf. By Rami Barham. Rami Barham asked the following question. Hayu muhzakim. Okay, we're now in a totally different point. But why are we here? Because the mission talked about the slave. You can write it on the arm of the slave and give her the slave. So now, what if we have a situation where hayu muhzakim be'evet shushalom? Everybody knew this guy was the man's slave. Viget Katuva Yadon. We find the Eved. Number one, we find he's got a get on his arm. A, of a get for the woman, right? Not a get shikhur. We're talking about a get, a divorce document. And right now, the Eved is found in the woman's possession. Husband and wife are obviously living separately right now, and the Eved is found in her possession. But what's missing? Nobody saw the get be given from the man to the woman. Now, it's a slave. Slaves have legs. They can walk, right? If it's a piece of paper and it's in her property, we assume she received it from him. But if it's a moving animate object, right, or a person, maybe the person moved by themselves. So we don't know. Did she receive the get from her husband or did her husband write the get? Hasn't yet given it to her. And it happens that Evan went over into her property. Mahu, Mia Marina, do we say, he really did give it to her? Because remember, he not only does he have to give the Evid to the woman, but she gets to keep him now, right? In other words, no to Evid. So, Odilma, who didn't mean Or maybe he went by himself. 
on a Rava, the typical, now Rava says you got a bigger problem here. If you wrote the, now he seems to be ignoring the mission, but let's get the, we'll deal with that in a minute. But if you wrote on a slave, what's the problem? Well, remember we talked about, you can't have a Ketav Sheachol Izdayef. You can't have it written on something that could be forged. You could erase it and you would never notice, right? It has to be on something that you will notice if someone erased something and then you'll know it's forged. So if you write on a person, you can erase it entirely and write it, you know, change something, which means that it could have been there was a condition written here and it's no longer here. And then you can't go on this get because you have no idea. Maybe he wrote a condition and it disappeared, you know, in the, it's the, the Eved or someone rubbed it off. And, you know, it, it's not, it, this doesn't work at all. So they say, what kind of a question is this? Well, then the mission makes no sense. The mission says you could do it on Yad Shal Evan. So, Rabbi, how are you going to deal with that? They say, Rabbi could say the mission works if you give it on the hand of an Eved, and you give her the Eved, you give her the slave, is only if there's witnesses that watch this whole thing. And just like we saw about the blank paper, you know, the witnesses would have read, seen what's there, they would have seen that there's a condition. Or if there's no condition, they'd see there's no condition, and all is good. So who cares? It doesn't matter if the writing could be erased, because we hold like Rabbi Elazar, and you'd have to say, he holds like Rabbi Elazar. That's how he understands the Mishnah. And it's where there were Ede Mesira. But our case, we already said, is a case where there are no Ede Mesira. And that's why Rabbi asked the question specifically here, but not on our Mishnah. Now they say, but still, Lirami Barhama Kasha. But according to Rami Barhama, this is going to be a problem. How's he going to answer this? So they say, Lirami Barakasha, Lirami Barakasha, Nami And as Rami Barakasha was the one who asked the question, why aren't we worried, Rami Barakasha, that this is a Ketav Sheachol that you could forge? So what does he answer? A very interesting answer. Bik Tovet Ka'aka. It's where he was tattooed with the Get. Now why is this a very strange answer? Because it's forbidden to tattoo by Torah law, even on your slave. You can't tattoo because slaves, remember, are obligated in all negative commandments. So it would have to be a case where someone went against the law, tattooed it onto the slave, and now the slave is in the possession of the woman, and the question is what? And we're not worried. It could be for it. It could be, you know, erased, and someone could forge something because there's no way to do that when it's tattooed. So now they just point out, Hashidati lahafi, if already you're going to say that, Matniti nami lo tovekaka. You could say that the Mishnah was talking about tovekaka. Anyway, my havela, but what's the answer to the question? Rish Lakish says about animals that because animals move around, you can't claim, when it comes to land, if I live in land and you don't complain for a while, I can claim, right, it's three years, but you, I can claim this land is mine. If you haven't complained in three years, the fact that I'm living here shows me. But if an animal is in my possession and you claim it's my animal and we have proof that it was your animal before and we don't have any proof that you sold me the animal or something like that, then... The fact that the animal is in my possession is irrelevant. Why is it irrelevant? Because the animal could have gotten there on its own, as opposed to an inanimate object, which doesn't just appear in my house magically. So, obviously, the evidence is going to be the same if an animal, all the more so, a person. So, therefore, we actually don't assume that she's divorced. By Rami Barham, last question, and for this we're not going to resolve it today, and we're going to get to a big women's issue, although it's a bit of a debate whether this is a women's issue or not, and the Suga is going to go into that. But here goes our question. Again, he needs to write the get, which again, we said she pays for it, but it has to be on an object of his. You know, when you go to a wedding and they always ask, I don't know if you know this under the chuppah, right? They always ask the groom, did you buy this ring? Is it yours? It has to be owned by him in order for him to give it to her. Same thing here. He needs to own the thing it was written on. Now, if it was written, everybody knew this tablet, that it was hers. Okay? Everybody knew it was hers. It was maybe some unique something, and everybody knew that. Viget katuvaleha. And now we find this in her possession. Okay, Vihi Harehi Yotse Mitachat Yado. She is no longer married to him, right? It seems. And she's got this tavla that was hers with a get written on it. But it was hers, not his. So does it work? Mahu. Because if in the end it was owned by her at the time he gave it to her, then he didn't give her anything because he gave her something that was already hers. So do we assume, she must have given it to him and said, I'm giving you this tabla as a gift. It's yours. Then he wrote, he had it written on. Again, she paid for it to be written on. And which we already said the rabbis gave rights to that already to the husband. 
but the rights to her tavla they can't do. So that was hers. So when she gives it to him as a gift, and then he gives it back to her, that should work, right? Or Odilma, now here the word appears here in parentheses. Isha is in parentheses. A woman, lo yada la knuye. Or is it just lo yada la knuye and not specifically because she's a woman, okay? And you'll see it's not so clear whether the sugi is concerned because she's a woman. Maybe she doesn't know how to do this. What does it mean she doesn't know how to? Well, maybe she thinks if I just give it to him and say, here, you can use this, that's enough. But she can't really. She has to actually do a formal act of acquiring where she says, here, I am giving this to you. It is now owned by you. Okay, so she knows she's getting it back. So maybe she thinks, ah, I just need, it's not uh, such a formality. I'll just say, here, why don't you use this? But if she just says that, she's not actually giving it to him. So the question is, right, again, two ways to understand this. Either, the, either they're asking because she's a woman, does she not know how to do this? Or is it just in general, maybe people don't really know this so well. And the first proof that's not, they don't think right away at least, it's because she's a woman, is they bring some case about a man. And they say, let's see what happens. Let's learn from Yerubais. So someone gave this testimony about a small village that was on the side of Jerusalem, and there was this elderly man who loaned out money to everybody. And he would write the documents. Now, in general, it's supposed to be the Love who writes the IOU. But instead, he wrote, as the blender, he wrote all the documents. And then he had other people sign. And the rabbi said, this is totally fine. There you need a sefer mikne. So Rashi explains. Right, the one who's passing on something to someone else, right? Like saying, I owe you, or right, they need to be the ones to write it. And that doesn't exist here. So they say, does it not work because the Amrinan aknuye machnilu? Does it not work because we assume, yeah, he wrote them all, but then he gave it to them through an acquisition, a, a, an, a, an act of a Kenyan. And that's why. So here we see we can assume that people do Kenyanim. So likewise, we can assume the woman did a Kenyan. Now you might say, why did I bring up this whole woman's issue? Well, you're going to see tomorrow that some of the sources say, well, maybe it's a difference of a woman, and we'll, we'll get to that tomorrow. Um, and I'll leave it. As a, as a, you know, in suspense about what they actually say about women. Do they know this halacha? Do they know they need to do this or not? So, quick review of our daf. We started with the story of the man who gave the Sefer Torah, and Rav Yosef gave three possibilities about what could, what could maybe we have thought that it would work, but obviously it doesn't work. We have Rav Chista who said, can you write on top of the lettering, right, it, to do it lishma when it wasn't on lishma in the first place? Or not? Is it the same machlok as Rabbi Huda and the rabbis when it comes to the Sefer Torah? Rav Acha said, no, it's not the same thing. Even the rabbis would agree there it might be a problem, but here it wouldn't be a problem. And then we talked about how that connected with the previous sugi, which seems to say it doesn't work at all. Rav Chista then said, I could disqualify all team, but that didn't work because we didn't know. Oh, not that it didn't work. It's just we didn't ever understand what he meant. Rav gave two explanations, but they were both rejected. Then we went into the whole thing about writing because he mentioned it. We went into writing on something that's not worth anything. Um, and then we talked about that. Then we went to the thing about katav lo chakak. What does it mean lo chakak? Chakak is a problem only if it's done where you where you chisel out the empty spaces and end up with the letters raised but not the other way. The other way actually works as writing. And then we compared that whole thing to the seats and the coins, and we talked about that whole issue. Then we got to writing the get on gold and then giving her the gold as a tubo. Which case does it work? In which case doesn't it work? What does he have to say? Does there have to be in the margins? No, they really don't. It's, you're not worried about Otio Porchot because in the end it all goes to her anyway, and yet could still count as her tuba. Then we had, um, if he keeps the paper to himself, though, that's a problem. We asked that question about between the lines. What about that? Then Rami Barhama asked these two questions about the Eved. It's found in her possession, but we don't know whether the husband actually gave her the get. In the end, we say it's not a get because we need a de Masira, basically. And we need to know that the get was given. We have no idea. He has feet. He walks on his own. He could have gotten there on his own. And the last thing which we're left with is if the object that he gave her was hers, it's a problem. So what if we don't know whether she actually gave it to him in a real act of acquiring or not, can we assume it was done the way it was supposed to be done or not? And we're in the middle of that question. And as I said, the question is really, do we suspect because she's a woman or maybe not? Maybe we just suspect people in general that they don't really know these halakha. 
with that, we finished today's staff. Have a great day, everyone.